let's explore the algebraic properties of matrix column vector multiplication. We're going to do that by actually stating a theorem and then exploring the different features of that theorem using some base case information. Let's read the theorem statement in full. So theorem one, algebraic properties of matrix column vector multiplication. We're going to let A be an element of R M by N, meaning that A has M rows and N columns, each entry of which is a real number. This is a matrix. We're going to let X and Y be an element of R N by one. These are both column vectors with N rows and one columns. The number of rows of these column vectors matches the number of columns of our matrix A. The inner dimensions must agree. We're also going to let A and B be an element of the real number, meaning these are scalars. If these three assumptions hold, then the theorem statement that we're reading claims that each of the following laws must be true. First law we're going to call distributivity. If we multiply a matrix A by a vector sum X plus Y, where the vector sum is happening first and then we do multiplication, we're claiming we can distribute the A just like we would in real numbers. We can pass the A over to the X and we can pass the A over to the Y. So A times quantity X plus Y is equal to A times X plus A times Y. The next algebraic property that we see, if we take A and multiply that by the scalar vector multiplication alpha times X, that is equivalent to alpha times a times x, where we can pull the scalar multiple outside of the vector, meaning scalar multiples can be done inside the vector or outside the product. Finally, we have something called linearity, which is a outside of alpha x plus beta y for any alpha and beta that are scalars. That's equivalent to saying that we can actually distribute a inside and pull the alpha and beta out. So this would be alpha times ax plus beta times by. Here's a claim. If I have these two, I get this one for free. If I have this one, I get the other ones for free, which we're going to see in future videos. For those of you watching my playlists at home, and this is the first time you've thought about this, I want you to throw a digital tomato my way. Rotten, I hope. I just stole from you some of the most beautiful parts of mathematics, which is we've done a definition and then when you play with that definition for a while, you might discover these for yourself. But oftentimes in a quarter system or even a semester system, one of the things that we're tasked to do is to get you onboarded with math that other people have discovered so that you can do more interesting things than spend a few hours per day recreating the wheel. So in this situation, I'm kind of stealing your thunder. Thunder, lightning in the thunder. I'm taking away the process of discovery by telling you the result. And then what we're going to do is break down that result to see if whether it's not since true. Just because I claim it doesn't mean you have to believe it. In fact, one of the things I like to tell my students is I want you to assume that I'm full of shit. Don't trust me. Confirm and verify for yourself. And then after you verify, be like, okay, he wasn't lying to me this time, but maybe next time I'll catch him in a lie, right? Don't trust me. Just because I'm an authority doesn't mean that I'm telling you the truth. With that in mind, what we're going to do is actually explore in this video, distributivity. And we're going to do so using two different resources. Specifically, we're going to start with some key problem solving questions that come from this book, George Poria's How to Solve It. I have a blog post that I'll link to in the description for this video that breaks down some key problem solving questions that we can use to explore this distributivity process a little bit deeper. And the second book I want to highlight is uh, written by a guy named Daniel Solo. It's called How to Read and Do Proofs. You can see his name here, Daniel Solo. One of the things that's really interesting, for those of you that want to know more about how to structure a formal mathematics proof, this book has a lot of good information. We're going to explore one technique called the forward and backward technique as we get deeper into what distributivity is and how it plays out and whether or not this statement is true. With that in mind, let's go ahead and dive deeper into distributivity. We'll do some backwards work on the logical formalism that is involved in stating mathematical theorems. Theorem is a very special thing. It's a mathematical statement that often is accompanied by what we call a proof. And there's a logical structure underneath that at its base is called a conditional statement. Anytime we see a mathematical theorem, we can restate those theorems in the form of a conditional statement. And that takes the form P implies Q, where the implies is this double arrow sign. The P is going to be a mathematical statement that has a truth value. So it's either a true statement or a false statement. The thing that shows up before the implication side is called the antecedent. And then the statement Q, which again is going to be a statement that has truth value. It's going to be either true or false. 
That comes after the implication sign and is called the consequent. Anytime we're analyzing a theorem, we can write it in the form if P then Q or P implies Q. One of the ways that we can prove a statement in the form if P then Q is called a direct proof of P implies Q. This is a conditional statement. To prove the statement in the form if P then Q, we assume the antecedent P is true, and then we show if the antecedent is true, the consequent must follow from that assumption. With that logical structure in mind, let's go back and read the theorem statement and see if we can explicitly state this theorem in the form of a conditional statement and identify both the antecedent P and the consequent Q. When we read the theorem statement, we get some clues to this. This word then is a major clue. So too are the assumptions in the first sentence. Specifically, we're looking for if something is true, then some other thing must be true. Notice that in the first sentence, we're actually assuming a lot to be true. We're assuming A is an R M by N. It's a real matrix with M rows and N columns. We're assuming that we have two vectors, each of which has N rows and one column. We also assume that we have some scalars, but if we look at the thing that we're trying to show, in other words, in this case, it's distributivity, we see that if we assume all this to be true, then we get the following pieces to be true. Let's focus in on the first one, a times x plus y equals ax plus ay. We note that we actually don't need the scalars in this situation. All we need is the matrix and the vectors. With that, we restate our theorem by specifically identifying the antecedent and the consequent. In this case, we're gonna say if antecedent P is true, in other words, A is in R M by N, and X and Y are in N by one, this is the thing we're going to assume to be true in our direct proof. If this is true, then this theorem is stating, it must be the case that A times quantity X plus Y, N quantity, is equal to AX plus a y. However, in our quest for a formal mathematical proof, I'm going to refer back to our key problem solving questions. I wrote a blog post on this. I will link to it in the description below, right near the timestamp for this particular part of the video. This blog post that I wrote highlights key questions for solving problems, and I want to really focus in on step two of the process of problem solving, which is devising a plan. Specifically, we're trying to devise a plan to prove this theorem in general. And I wanna move right down to the simplifying the problem situation. One of the key powers of a mathematician when solving general problems is to create sub-problems that are related that give us deep intuition. Finding the general proof for any value of m and any value of n might be difficult, so instead, why don't we create a more accessible and related problem that gives us insight into the underlying dynamics and allows us to extrapolate for the general case. In this case, what we'll do is instead of proving the general case, let's come up with a concrete example. This is actually an art coming up with good examples. We want an example that is big enough to be interesting and small enough to be manageable. So I wouldn't do a one by one and a one by one because that is too simple. It's too small to be interesting. Instead, I'm gonna go for three and four. So I'm gonna create a matrix with three rows and four columns and then vectors with four columns. Then I'm gonna analyze this example completely by filtering the if P then Q statement through the concrete example, always asking myself a question, what's the relationship between the concrete example and the more general problem that I'm trying to solve? With that trick in mind, let's go ahead and assume the antecedent to be true following our direct proof method. So we'll say that A is in R M by N, meaning A is in M by N matrix, all with real values. And then we'll let X and Y be column vectors with N rows and one columns having these values. The moment we make those assumptions, we actually can write A in general, it's an M by N matrix, and then use the specific values of M and N. So in this case, M is three and N is four. One of the questions I'm gonna ask myself, what would happen in general? Well, instead of just three rows, we would have M rows. And instead of just four columns, we would have N columns. Similarly, we know that X is a column vector with N entries. In this case, N is four, so I go down to X four. In the general case, it would be N. Y is a column vector with N entries. In this case, it's four, so I can actually write all of those down. We've now assumed our antecedent P to be true. Let's explore more about what the consequent is saying. Specifically, in the consequent, we wanna show that one expression is equal to another expression. We wanna show that A times X plus Y is the same thing as A times X plus 
a times y, that's called distributivity. Let's analyze each expression separately and ask ourselves some key questions related to our problem solving techniques that we discussed earlier. Specifically, when we look at the expression one on the left hand side, we know that A is gonna be an M by N matrix. Here we've assumed specific values for our intuitive case, our more simple case. And then we know that X and Y are gonna be N by one vectors. The moment that we do this, we might ask ourselves, do we know any theorems that could be useful? Can we write out the theorem statements in full? Can we translate notation into the problem that we're looking at? What about definitions that could be useful? The moment I start thinking this way, I might recognize that this addition is between two column vectors. So this must be a column vector, column vector addition. Yes, I do know definitions that might be helpful. In fact, we've studied column vector addition previously. The moment I know that, I might ask myself, well, if that's column vector addition, what operation is this? Notice on the left-hand side, we have a matrix. On the right-hand side, we have a column vector. So I'm thinking matrix, column vector multiplication. Yes, I do know definitions. In fact, I have two separate definitions of what that might be. I could use the linear combination version or the dot product version. The moment I see this, I can go run down those definitions and write them down for myself. Now that I've gotten some sense of what I might be thinking about on the left-hand side, let's do the same thing for the right-hand side. Notice on the right-hand side, we have the same situation. Over here, we have A times X, matrix on the left, column vector on the right. I'm thinking matrix, column vector multiplication. Same thing, matrix, column vector multiplication. Notice this addition is gonna be between, well, inner dimensions must agree. Those cancel out and I'm left with the outer dimensions M by one. So this is gonna be a M by one column vector. Same thing over here, M by one column vector, which means this is gonna be an Ve column vector addition between m by one column vectors. Over here, this is gonna be a column vector addition between n by one column vectors. So I'm already, just by looking at these different statements for the specific case and asking myself some key problem solving questions, getting some intuition on what I'm looking to do, both in general and for the specific case. Here's where we might take some inspiration from Daniel Solo's How to Read and Do Proofs. There are two different techniques that we're gonna practice in this video. One of them is called the forward direction technique, and the other one is called the backward direction technique. Let's start with the forward direction technique. Notice that the consequent we're trying to prove includes an equality between two expressions. In mathematics, we can think about equality as having two directions. One direction goes from the left expression to the right expression. In English, we read from left to right, so we might think about that as the forward direction. When we're using the forward direction technique, what we do is we start with the expression on the left and then do as much as we can using the definitions, theorems, any immediate information and work towards the expression on the right. Using that technique, let's start with expression one and then we'll specifically use the assumptions that we have for our simple case. Let's go ahead and fill out the entry by entry form of A and the entry by entry form of X and Y. With that, we'll call the substitution expression 1.1, but we can do more than that. The moment we see that X plus Y is in parentheses, we can use our definition of vector vector addition to actually just sum the individual entries. And leveraging the definition of column vector column vector addition gives us an equivalent expression 1.2. One question that we might ask is, how might this differ in the general case rather than the three by four case? Well, the general case, this would have M rows, this would have N columns, so matrix A would be an M by N, and then over here we would be doing N separate scalar additions across the rows since each X and Y would be our N by one. At this point we might ask ourselves, well, this is a matrix, this is now a single column vector, notice this is gonna be an M by N, and an n by one. So we're gonna do matrix column vector multiplication. Now we can apply some creativity. We've already seen two different definitions, one of which is called a linear combination version and the other is the dot product version. We get to choose which one we want. Since today is Tuesday, I'm feeling really lucky and I wanna use the linear combination version, which is exactly what I'll do. If you don't remember that definition completely, test yourself go find it, correct yourself, that's called active recall. This is a great way to test your memory. I do remember that, specifically the linear combination version says I'm gonna chop up my matrix on the left into columns and then pair each column with the associated scalar from my vector on the right. So linear combination, I'm gonna take a sum of column vectors. The sum is gonna be 
scalar one times column vector one plus scalar two times column vector two plus scalar three times column vector three plus scalar four times column vector four. One of the questions I'm asking myself is how would this change in general? I would continue down all the way to the nth value. So specifically, this is gonna be the sum from k equals one to n where x sub k plus y sub k gets paired, that's a scalar, with the kth column of a and I just go all the way down to the last column. The kth column in general is gonna be an m by one. In this case, m is three, which allows me to get insights into what that looks like. I'm not done at this point. I can actually do more because this is n equal four, I can actually write out all of what this looks like. So check this out. If I take k equals one, that means I'm gonna do x1 plus y1 right there. And then that's gonna be the first column of a, but the first column of a only has three entries because we saw that up there. So it must be a11, a21, a31. Then I go to the next value of k. So this is k equal two. I get x2 plus y2 times the second column. In this case, it's gonna be a m by one or a three by one. In general, it would have m entries. So I kind of get intuition on what that looks like. Similarly, k equals three and k equals n. So the last value is k equal four. And then each one of these, I might ask myself, well, how would I deal with this particular operation? I can't help but point us back to our list of problem solving questions. Do we know any definitions or theorems that might be useful? Well, this is a scalar vector multiplication. We have seen a definition for scalar column vector multiplication. Of course, I have to remember that. Let's do that specifically for this case. So if I have x1 plus y1 times the first column of a, I can bring that scalar into the each individual entry. So it's gonna be x1, y1 times a11, x1, y1 times a21, x1, y1 times a31. But notice each of those is just a scalar multiplication over a scalar addition. We know those are distributive based on arithmetic from our previous live. So I can bring each of the scalars inside and that gives me x1, a11, plus y1, a11, similarly in the second row and the third row. But now all of a sudden we see that we have two different vectors. We've got the vector over here. Now we're thinking about vector vector addition. Since we have the same sums across each entry, we can break those into two. And that gives me a copy of all entries along the first part and then all entries along the second part split into two vectors. In general, these would be m by one vectors. Here m is three, so that's the reason that the size is constricted. Now all of a sudden we see that there's a scalar vector multiplication, which means using the two directions, I can pull out that scalar. So I get x1 times the first column of a plus y1 times the first column of a. And just as a friendly reminder, I've just substantiated that if I take two scalars and multiply by a vector, if I take a alpha plus beta scalars times the vector a, that's the same thing as saying alpha times a plus beta times a. As a mathematician, I need to either prove this in general or quote a result. Here, I quoted the result because I remembered it, which is what the problem solving questions are all about. Having us go back into our memory and kind of think about what we know about it. There are times though, when we're doing mathematical proofs that we need to discover lemmas results that we use to prove some theorem. And in this situation, if we haven't proved it for ourselves, that's where math heads have to get serious and actually do the hard work of proving the intermediate result to get the general case. Using that intermediate result, we can translate each scalar vector multiplication into the sum of two scalar vector multiplications. In other words, we're distributing the vector across that scalar sum. We do that for each individual case. And at this point, perhaps, we've kind of gone as far as we have, we're thinking to ourselves, where are we going to this? And at this moment, maybe we take a breath and ask ourselves, what are we trying to do here? Well, remember we started with expression one and then we worked our way down to a sequence of expressions and we got here, but perhaps it's not immediately clear what we need to do next in order to get from this expression to that expression. In other words, our forward direction technique has produced some results, but we haven't sealed the deal. We haven't finalized that loop yet. And at this point we might take a break and say, well, we're not quite sure what to do with the forward direction, what else can we do? This is a perfect place to use what Daniel Solo calls the backward direction technique. In the backward direction technique, we reverse the order. So instead of starting with expression one and working towards expression two, what we do is start with expression two and work backwards. The only reason we say backwards is because we tend to read from left to right. In this case, we're reading from right to left. So it's backwards with respect to the way that we read normally in English. We're gonna go ahead and start with expression two and then work backward towards expression one. Well, expression two, we have a value for a, we've said it was three by four, so we could get intuition on the general case. If it was an m by n, this number would be m and that number would be n. Here, a times x is this times that. 
and then we're gonna add that to a times y, we can actually explicitly represent those. At this point, we might ask ourselves, well, what do we know about a times x? We've already decided that we're gonna use the matrix column vector multiplication definition via linear combinations. So in this situation, I remember, here's an active recall opportunity. If you don't have it memorized, test yourself and then verify your test and correct any mistakes. Remember, matrix column vector multiplication, if I'm gonna do it via linear combinations, I cut the matrix on the left into columns, and then I take a linear combination of those column vectors with scalar multiples coming from the vector on the right. So let's work backwards towards my result. Here I'm gonna sum over the columns. In our specific case, the number of columns is n, so each column of A gets paired with the corresponding entry of X. And this gives me all columns, and the same thing is true for Y. This is literally from the definition of matrix column vector multiplication via linear combinations. Because I know in my specific case that N is four, I can actually write out these sums specifically. So this is gonna be X1 times column one plus X2 times column two times X3 times column three all the way down to the bottom, we've put ourselves in position via hard work to compare our forward direction to our backward direction, and we might ask ourselves, what's the relationship between the two of these? Well, check it out. The forward direction, I have these x1, x2, x3 kind of distributed in between. The backward direction, all the x's are grouped together and all the y's are grouped together. And my question is, can I jump from here to here? Let's go back to our key problem solving questions. Do I know any theorems that could be useful? Well, we know a theorem that says that vector addition is commutative. In other words, it doesn't matter what order I do this. So I could bring all the X's over here and group them together as such, and all the Y's over there and group them together as such. And indeed, we've made the connection. At this point, let's go back to our original theorem, and we've shown for M equal three and N equal four, if I assume this antecedent, it must be the case that the consequent is true. I think you're now in a position to do this in general. In fact, we kind of sprinkled the hints in between here. How would the proof change if you wanted to use linear combinations to substantiate that distributivity must hold between matrix multiplication and column vector addition? What would you do to the approach that we just used to show that general result? That is my community challenge for this video. I also have another challenge, which is in this video, we used matrix column vector multiplication via linear combinations. What if you wanted to prove that this result using the dot product version. What would change in the proof and how would that affect the way that you process that information? Remember as you're working towards those challenge, use those key problem solving questions to guide your work. This is a great way to get intuition. I will say that if we wrote our notes really well on the specific case, it's almost unnecessary to write the general case for our own notes because all of the intuition that we need is hidden in that specific case. Some teachers get really cranky and want the general proof, in which case you can write that for yourself. This is a really good way to process problems. Break a hard problem into a specific problem, get intuition on that specific problem, set yourself up to make the connection back to the general problem, and then move forward. I thank you so much for your attention, y'all. In the next video, we'll attack the scalar multiplication algebraic property, but this time we'll approach it with the dot product version of multiplication to give you some hints on how to do that. I'll see you in that next video.